many of you like so so let me let me describe a situation from my childhood i uh grew up sioux falls south dakota and uh, my parents built a new house on the east side of town and and as a, a young couple thankfully my parents were fortunate they 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 I, I think they paid, or they began the loan on the house, actually, before we moved in. And uh, it was 1979 when they took out the loan on the house, and then early spring 1980 when we moved in. So we moved in, I think, just before, if you remember the early 80s, when interest rates went insane, right? So, so fortunately, we were able to get into that house. But, but we were a single-income family, and there was lots of other complications of beyond that in my family's life. But uh, we never had a whole lot. And one of the things was when my parents built this house, uh, I had an unfinished basement, didn't have a garage or anything. And so the hope was someday we would finish off that basement. Well, here we are in 2018 and still not finished. Um, <laughs> so whatever that is, I guess. But, uh, but when I was a kid, at first when we moved into the house, of course, you move in and, and you don't have anything in the basement yet. So, so it's like a giant play space, right? Because all it is is four walls and a cement floor. And then in one corner is a, a washing machine and a dryer and a sump pump. And uh, I guess there was a water heater and a furnace underneath the stairs in the basement. That was the totality of everything that was in the basement. And then eventually over time, more and more stuff begins to accumulate. If you've got a basement, I've got a basement. You know how that kind of goes for most of us. And, and that happens. Well, one of the things was because it wasn't the finished basement, um, we just had the four single lights, right? With a pull chain Little, little, little string with a little metal bell at the bottom, right? And, and they were in the four corners of the basement. There weren't light switches or anything. So, so when you went down the stairs, and these, these were the stairs because it's not finished again, so the sides are open. There is a handrail, but if you're not careful, you'll fall onto the cement floor uh, all the way down into the basement. And you get down to the base of the stairs, and then it's complete darkness because you're underground and there's no light switches to pull. So if you wanted to be in the basement, you had to make your way over to one of the four segments of the basement where you could blindly stumble through praying. You found a, a, a light rope and not a spider web, right? Because you know what that's like. You, you, you look like you're in Kung Fu when you walk into one of those spider webs in the dark, right? Anybody else ever done that? Yeah, and so, so you're, you're trying to find that, of course. And then you get that light on, and then you play. But here was the thing, uh, that as a kid, for whatever reason, going to those strings, I was never afraid, right? I could get to the bottom of the stairs, I could walk up, I could get to that string, I could pull that string, the light would come on, I'd go turn the other lights on, we, I could ride my bicycle around in the basement, or roller skate, or whatever it is I wanted to do. That was all great and fine. But I always had to shut the lights off, or I'd get in trouble, right? So you'd go around the basement, one, two, three... And you get to that fourth one. Now if you pull that last string, it gets dark real fast, right? Real fast. Now how fast can you get from that string to the stairs? I don't know how fast I can do it, but it's nearly the speed of light. Because I was afraid of the darkness. Irrationally so. Even when there was nothing else in the basement, I had just had all the lights on. There's nothing else there. There's nobody else there. It's, it's me and a couple of toys, right? But for whatever reason, if I was going to pull that string, the final one, and it was going to go dark, I was afraid. Illogically, but afraid. And that's childhood. Maybe, maybe for you it was in your bedroom. How many of you would turn off your light and try to leap to your bed without touching the floor, right? Or, or closets. you got to have that closet door closed because they're kind of scary in the dark, right? Am I bringing up some bad memories for anybody? Sorry. I didn't mean to traumatize you coming to Glory Baptist Church this morning. But, but, but that's, that's the way it was, right? You know what I'm talking about, most of you. But here's the thing about darkness. Just a little bit of light can change everything, right? All it takes is for you to put on a tiny little nightlight. That's all it takes. And then all of a sudden, the darkness isn't scary anymore. Now, all throughout the scriptures, you can see light contrasted with darkness. In the beginning, God spoke, 
and he created the light, he said. He spoke it into existence. And then all throughout the Bible, as you study the Bible, you'll see God is referred to as light. And then you'll also see our spiritual enemy, Satan. He's frequently referred to as darkness, right? He's the prince of darkness, right? And so throughout the Bible, there's this contrast between light and dark, God and Satan. And today we're going to look at one of the the, the most uh, inspirational, life-changing I Am statements that Jesus ever made. It's found in John 8, 12. You've got uh, some Bibles in the chairs. You can look it up on your phone or you'll see it on the screen. John 8, 12 simply says this. These are Jesus' words. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you follow Jesus, you will never walk in darkness which is a good thing because as I said darkness is scary right in fact when Jesus told Paul something he used light and darkness to make his point he said this in Acts 26 17 and 18 Jesus said yes Paul I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light And then from the power of Satan to that of God. We we see this contrast again and again between darkness and light. And Jesus makes this life-changing statement. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And if you've grown up anywhere in the church, right? You've probably heard this statement many, many times over across your life. But I found as I talk with people about this passage, and particularly about this I am statement, most people don't actually know the context in which Jesus said this statement. It's a very interesting story. It's one of the most powerful I am, if not the most powerful I am statements there are. And the statement actually comes after one of the greatest grace-filled stories in all of the Bible. A story some of you will probably be familiar with. It's a story that's known as the woman who was caught in adultery. It was right after that story that Jesus made this I am statement. I am the light of the world. And so what I want to do today is is I want to break down the story a little bit of this woman caught in adultery, dig into it a little bit, and see how that leads into this life-changing statement by Jesus. So we'll be almost exclusively in John 8, as I said. And as we look at John 8, I want to break it down into three different parts to make it easier for us to digest it. We're going to look first at the law, then the love, and then the light. The law, the love, the light. Great alliteration, right? Pastors like those things. Three L's. Makes it easy. Law, love, and light. Kind of sounds like the bad title of a cheesy Clint Eastwood film, doesn't it? The law, the love, and the light. You don't know if you're going to get the gun or the grin. Which will it be? Do you feel lucky? Right? Nobody else Clint Eastwood fans? All right. Whatever. I'll go home and watch them by myself then. But let's start right here if you're taking notes. We're going to start with the law. See, the law, what it does is it reveals our guilt. Watch as this is true in the story, in John 8, 2. It says, as Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all of the people were gathered around him, he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees had brought a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, This woman was caught in the act of adultery. Without a shadow of doubt, this is the darkest, most shame-filled, humiliating moment that she's probably ever had in her life. And she's standing there, and they ask Jesus, Jesus, should we stone her like the law says? following along, read down in verse 5. It says, In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say, Jesus? They're asking him, what what do you think? What do you think we should do? Verse 6. 
Verse 6 tells us they were doing this. They, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis to accuse Jesus. See, they, they wanted him to... They wanted him to say something wrong. They wanted to trap him, right? The law of Moses, if you don't know, says if you are caught in adultery, you get stoned to death. And they're like, hey, Jesus, what do you say about this? See, they were trying to trap him. Because if he goes, if he goes, yeah, 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 stone her, sinner. If he says that, then he's going to lose his reputation as being loving. But the quandary is, if he goes, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. You know, let, let, let's just let her off just this one time, right? And if he says something like that, he would be saying it's okay, to, or kind of okay at least, to commit a little bit of adultery here and there. I mean, you know, it's, it's okay to break the law of Moses maybe here and there, right? So they're trying to trap him to catch him, to corner him, to make him look foolish in front of his followers and all the people who were sitting down around him there studying and learning from him, trying to discredit him in front of all of these people who had gathered at the temple. Well, Jesus is going to do something really significant here. But before we get into that, don't miss this main point. The law reveals our guilt. We live in a world today where, where people do not like to admit that they're guilty, right? Long list of things I could give you as examples. But let's be honest. All of us, we, all are sinners, aren't we? Each and every one of us, pastor included, we're all sinners. And why is that important? The reason it's important is because until we see ourselves as sinners, we won't see a need for a Savior. And so it's the law that reveals our guilt. The law said that this woman is guilty. The law says we are guilty. But the good news is it doesn't stop with the law. The law reveals our guilt. But if you're taking notes, the love reveals God's grace. Yes, the law reveals our guilt, but the love reveals God's grace. And we see this through Jesus in verse 6. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him, right? And verse 6 says, but Jesus. And, and if, you're, if you're reading along in verse 6, it says, but Jesus. It's kind of like he's, he's, he's almost ignoring them. He's, he's, he seems to be almost ignoring this question. They're, they're like a fly. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, what do we do with this one? But Jesus, what are you going to do? How are you going to answer? Jesus, Jesus, what about this lady? What are you going to do? And verse 6, it says, instead of giving them a response, what does Jesus do? He bends down and he started to what? He started to write on the ground, right? Strange way to respond to a question, isn't it? That's a little crazy. It's like, hey, Jesus, do we stone her or not? And he ignores them, and he kneels down on the ground, starts drawing pictures in the sand or something, right? They're like, what's going on here? What did Jesus write? Well, the answer is we don't actually know specifically what Jesus wrote. A lot of scholars believe that and, and there is some evidence towards this, that it's quite possible as Jesus, see, he was seated, and then he got down on the ground and starts writing in the dirt. Uh, some scholars do believe that what he was doing is he started writing out some of the sins of those men there that day who had brought this woman who was caught in adultery. And he starts just writing in the sand, drawing on the ground, right? And since Jesus is God in flesh, he knows everything, and it's very possible that he's writing down, here's your sin, sin for this guy, uh, that's his sin over here. And then in verse 7 it says, when they kept on questioning him, it says he straightened up. And he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin pick up a rock and be the first one to throw a stone. 
Let he who is without sin cast the first stone at her. And Jesus is going after something that is really, really important. These judgmental, arrogant guys have the same problem that, frankly, all of us have at one point or another. Because, you see, it is easy to see somebody else's sin. And overlook our own, isn't it? You ever notice that, right? We talked about it a couple sermons ago. You look at like this little speck of sawdust in somebody's eye. Well, there's like a two-by-four sticking out of your eye. Right? You don't look hypocritical at all when that happens. It's so easy to pick other people apart. Well, look at her, right? Oh, look at him. Can't believe they do that. And then not even notice our own sinfulness. If you are without sin, cast the first stone, Jesus says. And then Jesus gets very serious in his message. In verse 8, it says, He stooped down, he wrote on the ground. And in verse 9, it says, And those who heard began to go away one at a time. First, the older ones. Only until Jesus and this woman were the only ones left. So, so Jesus is here. He's down on his knees. He's on the ground. He's writing. And then as he starts writing, these accusers start disappearing. The older ones first. So Jesus and this woman, this sinful woman, this woman caught in adultery, they're the only ones left. And in verse 10 it says Jesus he straightened up and he asked her, Woman. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And look at this grace. Has no one condemned you? And broken, ashamed, she's standing there probably in the darkest moment of her entire life. She says to Jesus, No one, sir. No one has condemned me. And Jesus looks up at this broken woman and he speaks perhaps the most grace-filled, lovelace words in all of history. Then neither do I condemn you. There's somebody who came here today who needed to hear this. Somebody who came in with a little bit of darkness, walked in with a little bit of shame or some agony over what you did or what you think. Or who you think you are. And when you are in Christ Jesus, you need to know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. His grace changes everything. You are not what you did. You are not what they say you are. You are who God says you are. And because of His grace... If you are in Christ, then there is no condemnation. Now don't get me wrong, there is an accuser, right? His name is Satan. Revelation 12 calls him the accuser, in fact. And you can put it down, oh, he's going to hurl insults at you, right? He's going to hurl accusations at you. It's that, it's that voice that, that says, after what you did, God can never love you, right? After how bad you messed up, you, you're not worthy of being forgiven. After all that you have done, you couldn't make a difference in this world. After all that you did, you could never have a good marriage. Oh, you blew it big time. It's over for you. Your life will never, ever be good again. Your kids will never respect you. After what you did, it's over. It's too late for you. Too much time has gone by for you, right? That's the voice of the accuser. That is not the voice of our Savior. The voice of our Savior says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. So who are your accusers? Send them away. Jesus says to her, where are your accusers? Where are they? 
Neither do I condemn you, for there is no condemnation in those who are in Jesus Christ. Whenever the accuser comes and accuses you of something in your past, just remind him of his future, okay? You're going down, Satan. Darkness never defeats light. Was she guilty? What's the answer, everyone? Yeah, she was guilty. Did she deserve punishment? Yeah, she had broken the law. But it was because of his love that grace was revealed. Because of his love. She didn't deserve it. But Jesus gave it anyhow. Grace. Capital G, grace. We are incredibly sinful. We're all guilty in the eyes of a holy God. Don't ever miss that. Until we see ourselves as sinners, we will never see our need for a Savior. The law reveals our problems, right? Our brokenness. The, The law reveals our guilt. But God's love reveals His grace. And He looks on this broken woman who's been shamed by all the other people that day. People have come from miles around to make a point of shaming her. And in that moment, Jesus drives her condemners away. And he says to her, Where are they now? Neither do I condemn you. Then what does he say next? Does he say, Okay, lady, Now that you're forgiven, try your best not to do that again, right? Does he say that? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, yeah, you know, now, since I'm Jesus, I I understand. You know, I understand you've got a past, and I understand you've got daddy issues, and I understand you've got problems with men, and I understand you've not made good decisions in your life. I understand your dad might have abandoned you years ago, and I understand you've had all these men in your life, and your whole life you've been looking for love in all the wrong places, Right? Just do your best. Try not to do it again. Try not to, you know, if you could, make a point of it. Try, darling, try not to sleep with married men as much as you can help it, right? Is that what Jesus says? He doesn't do that. And in the same way, he doesn't do that with our own darkness. He doesn't say to one of us men, hey, buddy, I've, I've forgiven you for lusting after pornography, and you're probably going to do it again, right? You're just a red-blooded guy. That's how things happen, and eh, that's just what men do. So just try not to do it every day or something, okay? Is Jesus like that? He doesn't say, he doesn't say, he doesn't say you, you know, I know you struggle with gossiping, right? Because there's really not much going on in your own life. And so the only way you find meaning is by, you know, tearing other people down with words. And if you could just, you know, try not to gossip around the holidays so at least we could have nice holidays. Right? Did Jesus do that one? Anyone? What does he do with this woman? The same, very same thing I think he does with each and every one of us. He looks at her in verse 11. And he had just said to her, neither do I condemn you. And then what does he say? He declares, go now and leave your life of sin. There's a a sense of urgency to this. Go now. Not later. Not, not, Not when you get to it. Go now. You see... You can be free. You don't have to live in darkness anymore. Go now. This very same voice that spoke to her, I believe, speaks to each and every one of us. Go now. You can be free. You don't have to be locked into a a world of darkness, a world of sin and shame. Jesus says, go now. There's a sense of urgency. Somebody needs to believe today that they need to be set free. That God can heal them. That's why you came today. Somebody needs to hear these words because I believe fully that God can set you free through Christ. That you can be healed. That you can be changed because light always overcomes darkness, folks. The law reveals our guilt. Don't miss that. The love 
reveals God's grace. But then the third thing within all of that, if you're taking notes, and here's the, the whole message right here, because it is the light that reveals our hope. The light reveals our hope, folks. And watch this in verse 11. This is the, the verse prior to Jesus' I am statement of today. Jesus goes, go now and leave the sin of your life. He's saying to her, hey honey, you don't have to live in darkness. You can be different. You don't have to hurt like you were hurting. You don't have to live in shame like you were living. You don't have to live in self-condemnation and self-hatred of your own bad decisions. He says to her, you can be different. Go now and sin no more. Why? Because in the very next verse, it says when Jesus spoke again to the people, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will what? Will never walk in darkness. Because they will have the light of life. Check this out. When Jesus looked at her and he said, neither do I condemn you. At that moment, he was no longer just the light of the world, but he actually became the light of her world. Personalize this message to yourself. He is no longer just this out there light of the world. But at this very moment, Jesus can be the light of your world. He has become the light of your world. And if that is true, that changes everything. Because darkness never defeats the light. There is not enough darkness in all of the world to even put out one single flame, not even the smallest of the candles. Darkness never defeats light. And the good news is that when you believe it, when it becomes personal, then he's no longer an out there God. He becomes your God. Jesus is your personal light. And when you know that, when you receive the freedom from that, the freedom of, from all of the condemning voices in the world, freedom from Satan who, who comes at you and tells you that you can't or you won't or you never will, when you believe that Jesus is the light of the world, those voices are silenced because you are in the presence of God's grace and of His goodness. The God who says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never be in darkness again. The law reveals our guilt. We are incredibly guilty. Don't miss that. Until we see ourselves as sinners, we won't know that we need a Savior. His love reveals His grace. But then His light, it reveals our hope. And at this moment of time, His light can illuminate your darkness. God's grace is sufficient to forgive your sins, whatever they are. His presence in your life can bring healing, can take away your shame. And you will never have to be the same again. Because when the light of the world becomes your light, the light of your world, and you begin to follow Him, then you never have to walk in darkness again. Our Savior is that good. Amen? He is the light of the world. Let's pray. God, we thank You that indeed, You truly are the light of the world. And Lord, that can sound strange or foreign or, or just hard for us to understand sometimes, God. But in the end, it simply means that you love us more than we could ever know. And that, God, you want to be in relationship with us. And as we head towards this Easter season as well, Lord, as we celebrate communion today, we are reminded of the lengths that you will go to show us your love. God, you tell us in Scripture, as we read the Bible, you make it clear 
that you would go to lengths that we could not fathom, we could never imagine, to show us your great love. God, you tell us in John 3.16 that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. That he may live a life we could not live and die a death we could not die and rise again from the grave and conquer sin and death so that we might be freed. As in John 3.17, Lord, you tell us, you didn't send us Jesus to condemn us, but to free us. But Lord, that only comes when we have a relationship with you. God, the Bible is abundantly clear that there is one way and only one way to eternal life, and it is through Christ Jesus. And God, today, I know many of us come into this place dragging some baggage behind us. Shame, guilt, hurt. Things that we go, well, yeah, God, you may forgive me, but I can't forgive you. No, if God can forgive you, you can forgive you too. God is greater. God is stronger. He is mightier. He is the conqueror, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-loving God. And in that today, if you've come here and you've got a past, the past you regret, sin and shame, that doesn't have to define you. Let us move forward. Let us go now and sin no more, as God calls us to do. Let us turn from our own way, old ways and start anew in Christ Jesus. And then find in Him the freedom where we are not condemned, but are loved. Where we are showing grace. So today, if that is you, you've never perhaps made a, a commitment to Christ. Maybe today is the day for you to do so. Today is the day for you just to stop and pray and say, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, forgive me of my sins. God, I turn to you and put my hope and trust in you, that you and only you can save me from my sin. And then, and Lord, as we confess our sin, each and every one of us are sinners. As we do that business with you, as we transact our sinfulness for your righteousness, God, may we turn away from those sins. Lord, we put our hope and trust in you. And God, so all of us on this day pray, take my sin away, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the freedom that we can find in him. God, continue to be with us as we enter into this time of communion. It is Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.